Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger and welcome to Dare to Dream. We've got a great installment for you today because the conversation today will be about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and the man you're about to meet just a little bit later on had a very definitive, dynamic, changing psychic experience where he found himself aboard a spaceship, a starship, telepathically communicating. And we'll get to that in just a minute. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award and most recently, Welp Magazine listed Dare to Dream as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to and watch this year. So thanks to all of them for their recognition. And the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. I thank them for the wonderful energy work they do out in the world. You can access their courses or become a facilitator anywhere in the world. Go to Dr. Dane here, D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I myself am Debbie Dashinger and I am a media visibility expert. I teach entrepreneurs, coaches, speakers, and healers how to write a highly engaging book. I have a company that takes author's books to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts to get massive results. If you would like your free gift to learn how to do any of the above, go and receive my templates and free videos. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And I am excited uh, for today's show. My guest is Douglas Taylor, who spent his life researching the unique and powerful lessons available that altered and transcended states of consciousness. Douglas is a multi-talented visionary artist, an author, speaker, surfer, and home builder. And during much of Doug's youth, he was a surfer traveling around the world, searching for that elusive, perfect wave. In 1978, on one of his surfing trips to Puerto Rico, he experienced a life-changing psychic encounter, finding himself inside a starship and telepathically communicating with its extraterrestrial occupants. On his return home from his trip, Douglas began having strange and wonderful psychic experiences that profoundly changed his life. Aided by a series of hundreds of beautiful communications and visions and dreams with extraterrestrials and celestial beings over the years, he continues to show his inspiration in his writing, in his painting, and his teaching. Taylor's visionary and UFO paintings are considered to be some of the best in the world. In addition to national radio talk shows and interviews with film and television crews from around the world, Douglas has taught hundreds of classes and workshops and wrote the enlightening book, Soulic Journeys. And if you would like to learn more about him, go to Douglas Taylor visionaryart.com. And with that, I welcome Douglas to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being able to speak with you and maybe share some information that'll be helpful Mm -hmm. to some of your listeners. And uh, that's kind of my main purpose. I try to keep it pretty low key because I don't consider myself to be a master or a teacher, I consider myself to be a student of the universe. And from the experiences that I've had, I've discovered that there is a lot more going on in the daily tribulations of a human being than what most people are aware of. And they can change those negative aspects of the experiences that they go through through utilizing what I would call an extraterrestrial science. That's yeah. what I have learned and that's what I have been studying mm-hmm. for many, many years. Even though, you know, you would think, well, where's his tinfoil hat if that's what he's talking about? But it's really something that I think has become a little more mainstream, you know, with the 60 minutes interview where even the Navy pilots were, you know, locking radar on objects that they had, didn't really understand what they were. They had no idea. So that's not really my 
main um, interest, the, you know, the UFO aspect of it, you know, it's, it's a means of getting around, it's like a car, you know, depending on your consciousness. But if you're really trying to elevate other people's spiritual awareness, then those UFOs become crystalline ships that are going to uplift and transcend anyone who comes in contact, either sees them or goes inside one in a dream state or in a psychic state. And so that's been a big part of my experience that has got me really, really charged up. Although my first experience happened um, in 1977 in the Caribbean islands. Let's start and there because I, I just want people who don't know you to have that background. So you have, you're a contactee, you have this experience. Will you just talk briefly about what happened and what your experience was, um, what might've taken place? Yes, it was um, intense to say the least. And yet at the same time, I wasn't even physically awake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a psychic experience. I had been surfing um, all that day, I was very tired. I came in, I lay down on the bed. I was living in Puerto Rico at the time. And I was just having the time of my life. I was 28, I was in my prime. I was surfing, you know, as good as I can surf. And, and it was just like an adventure of a lifetime for me. And, but I was always interested in reading different books to try to understand a little bit more about consciousness and how to develop my own I guess, awareness of a larger picture of who I am and who I'm, how I'm related to the universe. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. But uh, while I was laying there on the bed, I wasn't asleep, but I felt my body suddenly become like a pure energy. It was just an oscillating mass of energy that I had been experiencing a little bit of, cause I'd been very much into um, out of body experiences in sleep state and, and basically uh, that type of what, what is known as uh, lucid dreaming and stuff. So I had begun to kind of experiment with it, but anyway, so as I feel this energy, as I feel myself kind of like in a little bit of a, foggy state of mind, I begin to materialize, I guess is the best word to describe it. And I was staring at seven individuals, both male and female, and they were radiating the most beautiful, intense light, healing energy, and just positivism, but an intensity that made me feel very, um, very, I guess the best word would be um, very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Primitive, I guess would be one way to say it. But I just felt like these individuals were functioning, even though it was just an instantaneous, all of a sudden I'm in the ship and I'm looking at these individuals. It was like, I felt this power and it was almost a, memory that I had experienced before or a series of um, feelings that this was something that was was very, very powerful in the sense that I was having experience that was beyond anything that I'd had up to that point in time. And so as I was standing there and I saw these seven beautiful human looking beings, you know, they actually looked like surfers. I mean, you know, maybe that's just because of what I was seeing, but in, in the, the fact that um, that was my particular skin tone or whatever, but they were all blonde and they um, began communicating with me and it was all telepathic, which I had never had that experience before in any kind of dream even. And so they began communicating with me telepathically and relating that this isn't something uh, that they do as a means of helping people who are on the verge of, you know, trying to understand more about life and, and the universe itself. 
And I don't know exactly why I was the one who happened to be taken up into this ship, but I was standing there and I was just communicating telepathically. And they just gave me a little bit of background information and were just looking at me with these beautiful, beautiful, serene. And the captain, I've done an actual animation of the whole thing, but anyway, the captain was in a pure white suit and he had these intense eyes. I mean, he was just looking at me like he could look right through me. And so that in itself made me feel a little bit paranoid in a way. It was just like, you know, can I hide something here? These guys seem to know everything about me. I'm an open book. And I did feel very primitive, like I said, in, in relationship, but not in a way that they were putting me down at all. Just the opposite. They were lifting me up. I had never felt that uplifted, that. Were you scared? Do you did you feel because this is had no, to no, radical was, to wake up like that or become no, conscious? there was there was never any uh, sense of fear, and I think even if they would have landed their ship in front of the place I was staying in, I don't think I would have been afraid. I think I would have you know been happy just to walk right in because I don't know. I just had that kind of adventurous attitude, and there was nothing to feel afraid about especially in this circumstance, because I was so transcended, I guess you could say my, my consciousness was in a state more positive than I had ever really experienced before and expanding in a way where I seemed to be gaining tremendous amounts of information, which was more like all the little uh, neurons in my little brain were just like firing beyond their capacity. And I was just like going, what in the heck is going on? So anyway, as I stood there communicating with them, the individual who was the captain, who I knew as a captain, he had a, a female um, standing on his left and he just kind of pointed over to her as I was you know, standing there kind of feeling a little uh, sheepish. And she, cause I, you know, I just didn't understand how I was able to communicate with these, these beautiful beings. Anyway, so she just looked at me and I felt this energy come out of her eyes. And it was just like this intense beam of just pure, beautiful healing energy. And it uplifted me back because I began to kind of fall away from the state of mind of that upliftment just because I felt so inferior. And anyway, so it lifted me back up and it just charged me with this beautiful, beautiful energy. And I just started saying, can I go with you? Can I go with you? Can I, I mean, I was now as in euphoria, so to speak. They go, no, you're not ready to go with us, but uh, you know, maybe someday. And that was it. It was like, maybe seemed like maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, not a real long experience. And- Did they ever tell you who they were? That were they um, answers? Uh, really? What, what I picked up, you know, there's a lot of different people who talk about different uh, beings from different star clusters. And so it's, it's more of kind of a persona or a culture that people have an association with. So to me, it was like maybe like the, what people understand is the Pleiadians. Mm -hmm. You know, the Pleiadians are those individuals who are spiritually, um, intellectually and um, technologically super, super advanced because they've been evolving positively for, for, for a very, very long period of time. And they have a direct connection with various spiritual dimensions because they've kept that connection going. They haven't you know, become uh, disconnected from it by becoming egotistical. So that was what I think I, I've learned in, in all the time since then, uh, you know, that was like 45, 46 years ago, is that it's really understanding your ego and your identity of who you are, that you can begin to break down the barriers that are limiting you to a very, very tight lipped perspective to where the blinders are always just seeing down this specific tunnel and that the, in order to raise those blinders and move them away, you have to kind of change 
your way of looking at things in every single way, which mm -hmm. mainly is understanding your identity of self as not just this egotistical physical being, although you do have that part of yourself, but also understanding that you are connected to this vast cosmic intelligence that is infiltrating every cell in your body and is recreating and regenerating that intelligence and that life force. And it's an incredibly uplifting concept. And yet it's not an easy one to hang on to because there's so much garbage and crap that goes on. Well, let me ask you regarding hanging on to something. So Doug, you have this experience in 77, 78. Have you had other contactee experiences since? Yeah, this was um, this was just the beginning. You know, I mean, this was the kindergarten effect. What I learned uh, since that time was that um, these experiences started coming at me, you know, quite rapidly. But one of the things that helped to stimulate it was I, when I got back from that trip, about a week later, came back from Puerto Rico, and I lived in the Sunset Beach at the time near Huntington Beach. Anyway, so I started drawing and painting. And, and you've never, never been that. an artist before. You never. No, no, I had no house. friends of mine couldn't even believe it. You know, what, what, what's this? You know, when did you start doing that? So anyway, you know, it was just something that I now I suddenly felt when I was doing something creative like this, that I was bringing that same uplifting feeling, tuning into it in a sense. So what I've come to understand since this time 46 years ago is that I've always been, and everybody is, a transceiver. You know, you're both receiving and transmitting information. And it's just a matter of where are you receiving your radio signals from or your cosmic signals from. You know, if it's coming from your lower subconscious, hate, anger, fear, those elements are always going to have a specific frequency that they're going to respond to you in a way that you are frequency wise in a lower consciousness. And is so, that what you mean by, I know you use the term frequency relationship. Is that what you're alluding to here? Yes. In other words, you know, when the, the picture or the radio signals are going out by the millions, you know, now they're satellite signals. And anyway, they're going through the room, they're going through our bodies, they're, they're there of every kind, but there's also spiritual signals. There's consciousness signals, which are waveforms that are pitched to a higher frequency. And so how do you tune into those? Well, normally they'll just go right over your head because you just simply can't tune into them because they're on a, a level that you're not, your frequency isn't compatible with. So as you do the various elements, which I found in my particular case, was seeing a lot of the negative aspects of my own personality and character, which most people don't find that to be something they want to do. But that was something that really stimulated the healing process. And so that was the most important factor. And as I began to research into what the so-called uh, extraterrestrial science was, I began to understand that a huge part of it was reincarnation and that we've all lived many, many lifetimes. And that in those past lifetimes, I had been involved in a lot of really uh, negative activities and killing people, being involved in wars, just like everybody has, but those had become a, um, more um, powerful part in a sense of my psychic structure. So the psychic body is this energy body that's basically radiating every experience that you have is being uh, brought into your consciousness and is forming the psychic anatomy on a moment to moment basis. So if you're involved in obviously killing somebody, the frequency is of a horrible, horrible low frequency and it creates a block within your psychic so that you're slowly cutting yourself off from that inflow from that higher intelligence. And so that's kind of the main part of the process of learning is how to make that connection 
and it has to do with removing the blocks. And I had a lot of them, and I still yeah. do. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk about universal principles, because I know that you like to talk about these universal principles so that we can have a better, a good connection with our spirit guides and with our higher self. What are those principles? What are universal principles? Well, the main universal principle is that we identify ourselves as these physical beings. But if we were to break down the actual nature of this physical body, we'd find it turns as we go into the smaller and smaller elements of it, it turns into atomic structures, it turns into uh, organs, it turns into molecules, it turns into smaller and smaller little parts of energy, finally, you know, electrons. So we identify with this physical body as being something that is the reality of who we are, but in, it, in and of itself, it's something completely different. So in my perspective of the universal principles, it's that there is this psychic body that is recording everything that we've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And it has been for thousands of lifetimes. So the number one universal principle is be aware that you have all of this information within you. And in order to begin to tune into a higher uh, connection, and begin to remember what you came here for. I mean, it's so easy to get distracted that, you know, it's, it's not just fun and games, although there's no reason why you can't have a lot of fun and enjoy yourself while you're doing this because it's so joyful. But it's so easy to get distracted and get, you know, move off onto a tangent where you're actually reversing your progression because you're either progressing forward or you're regressing. You can't be just, floating in the middle you know you're either going with the river with the flow of the river or you're going against the river mm -hmm. and going with the flow of the river in a sense is the easy way that's kind of taking yourself down the path of believing that the physical world is all that exists so to speak and they say you have to swim up river river and it kind of takes a certain amount of effort to begin to do that but as you do it you finally begin to gain a balance and a momentum and then you find that you're all of a sudden living in a higher state of consciousness as you leave this physical body and go on to the inner worlds where there are teachers who are gonna help you to take your next mission and carry on because it doesn't happen in one lifetime. If you live a thousand lifetimes, imagine all the garbage that's in your psychic. So it takes time and energy and effort to begin to work through it, work it out and get to a point to where you could actually share something positive with other people. And yeah. so my art has been one of the things that has been such a positive way for me to connect with those universal principles because a huge part of it is creativity. Because like I said, the universal um, mental process, the mind itself of, of God, as they want to call it, is a creative process. It's creating everything that exists including us. So when you can tune into that in just some small way, you're actually putting yourself in a better relationship with that creative, um, re creative aspect of yourself and its relationship to a greater field of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And what about Atlantis? And what about Lemuria? Is there technology that you yourself are aware of that balances nature as an expression of spiritual evolution? Yeah, those are very, very uh, fascinating um, topics to get into because there really isn't any, you know, strong physical evidence that Atlantis or Lemuria ever existed. There isn't really any solid evidence. And you would think a society or civilization that was much more advanced than ours would have all sorts of stuff uh, that would have never decomposed or would be around, you know, so I think about that at times, but I know that I lived in both of those, or I feel very certain that I lived in both of those civilizations in many, many different lifetimes, and so that's part of this long history of going through the solic journey of my own particular development, and in some cases, I went backwards, in some cases, 
I made good progress. So it's kind of like now I'm at a point where I need to focus a little bit more on um, what is really important in life, you know, and it's hard to do because the distractions are, are just never ending. Like what money, the bills, all the stuff it? that you got to deal with. Is that what's imp- what do you mean by what's important in life? What for you do you feel is what you need to say? Well, you go through this life, you know, I'm, I'm a certain age now, I'm 68. And I, feel, I look back on my life and I don't. Man, you look good. good. You look amazing. Really? Well, you're, you're seeing it through a filter here. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just like, it's gone so quick. It's mm-hmm. just boom. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm in the last. 10% of my lifespan in this physical body, what have I learned? Am I really ready to make that transition? Do I know what the heck's going on? Do I know where I'm going to go? Do I know what I'm going to do? You know, so I think it's important to have that knowledge. The more you have, the more you can understand it, the better you're going to be able to make that transition. And there are people who there, you know, who are teachers who are going to are going to be helpful because most people need a lot of help you know yeah. it's, it's just the nature of of the people who live on this planet in particular i mean i can't talk about other planets because i haven't been to any other planets but <laughs> the people on this planet in particular seem like they're just not very interested in true spiritual evolution you yeah. know it's there's a lot of religious connotations to things that took place you know, a couple thousand years ago, and when there was no science, where people, you know, wrote books that had no relationship, even to the events that were happening at that time, they were changed by people to be able to control the masses in certain ways. And so that's kind of the what you would call the lower negative forces that exist. And there's a war, in a sense, a mental process by which those forces are always trying to pull you down. So how, the more association you have with them, the more locked up you are in that lower consciousness. And so it's harder to see the higher consciousness. Oh, so that's God. one of the big ones I think is, is religion is, is um, I mean, it has its positive aspects. Obviously everybody needs to have some sort of connection yeah. with something beyond, you know, not putting religion down per se. I'm just saying that it needs to have a scientific, uh, spiritual relationship or uh, connection that would make it into what, what, what I call extraterrestrial science or universal mm-hmm. principles, whatever you want to look at it. Okay. So now you've said multiple times you have had this experience and this contact experience at any time, did these beings reveal to you any evidence of ET advanced technologies that our planet would benefit from? Do you have any awareness of any technologies that you can disclose here? I can give you information about the reasons why they haven't done any of that. Okay. And uh, of course, I'm a Star Trek geek from way back. And we all know, you know, if a more advanced civilization was to interfere in a primitive civilization, it's gonna cause more damage than good. You know, just exactly similar to when, you know, the Spanish, whoever it was, who was, were sailing their ships and would land, you know, in uh, whether it would be America or India or the Caribbean islands, and they, they found these beautiful Indians there who had this wonderful lives and they would plant their flag. And all of a sudden we claim this in the name of, you know, Spain or England. And then before you know it, everybody who lived in that more primitive civilization, cause they didn't have the weaponry to be able to fight off these crazy people ended up being destroyed. And so that's, I think, a very common factor and anybody who is more intelligent and advanced on a spiritual level would never interfere in another uh, individual's um, development because that would actually hurt that person because if they're not getting it through their own 
development struggle and understanding through their learning process, then it's not going to really have any meaning. You know, it's kind of like, okay, we, we were able to um, discover, you know, splitting an atom. And so that's an incredible thing. Can we, you know, utilize it for a positive purpose? Well, yeah, you can create, you know, power plants and turns out they can be incredibly dangerous in their own right, but we can also, what else can we do? Well, with the waste that, it, that they make, we can create nuclear bombs and, you know, and so it's like, why would they want to give us technology that we've already demonstrated we don't have the capacity to use in an intelligent way? I mean, it's, it, it's something that can happen over a period of time, but I see it as happening over a period of many, many hundreds, maybe thousands of years. It could happen faster. I just, it just seems like it's so obvious that everybody on this planet are still kind of lost in the, the same struggles of their past, you know, they're yeah. living in their past. I hear this over and over and over again with every extraterrestrial expert who comes on this show. So you're definitely right in the path of what everybody else brings up. And same question, what about with all your contact experiences, what kind of information or downloads, you were talking about feeling like things were firing, so you came back with all of this. Is there information you now have that you never had before that they imparted to you? Absolutely. Um, I'll just give one demonstration of something that a lot of these are actual experiences that are happening in, in my dream state. And um, I had a, my mother died when I was about 10 years old. She had cancer, uh, breast cancer, and she was in the next room and she was very having a tremendous pain. She was screaming, you know, went on for years. And then she finally passed. That was horrible, you know? I mean, it, it affected me, it affected my brothers. It was horrible for my dad. And I was just in complete and total shock as being a 10 year old kid who was not understanding this and having tremendous insomnia. And I would have these nightmares where the name of the street I lived on, I don't know why this filtered into the whole experience was Gravier Street. Wow. 1013, I still remember 1013 to Gravier Street. Anyway, so the whole main uh, mental picture I have of that time is just so scary and so dark because I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. So I would just black out in these nightmares and um, it went on and then it finally kind of dissipated as I got more older and we got into surfing that really helped me a tremendous I, th I thought when I started surfing and I started really getting into it it was like okay I'm a happy person I'm I'm as happy as I could ever be there's nothing now that I could possibly do that would make me happier and uh, of course that lasted for a certain amount of time but then all of a sudden it wasn't doing it for me anymore and that's when I started having a lot of these spiritual experiences because there had to be more to life than just you know surfing waves and being involved in that and so anyway so I evolved out of that and my mother then as I continued to uh, study about past lives and try to understand some of the psychic implications of the astral worlds and the people who are influencing and affecting us who we can't see you know whether they're people who have left their physical bodies and are stuck in a negative state of consciousness or just thought form bodies, you know, that are just obsessions that are disconnected because somebody just is so depressed or suicidal or whatever. So anyway, the experience came out in a way that all of a sudden I realized that my mother had been in a cell next to me when during the, the uh, religious wars and that she was tortured to death and they used to cut off the women's breasts. Mm. And that's what she had. She had a you know, vasectomy or whatever, they, not a vasectomy, it's the other kind of thing. Anyway, so that past lifetime. Mastectomy. Yeah, mastectomy. That particular past lifetime where she 
was my mother in that lifetime, and I was a young kid in that lifetime, now it's repeating itself because the energy's already been instilled within my psyche, and it has to repeat in a way so that I can overcome the problem that was there. But at the time, I didn't have any knowledge or understanding of how to do it. But now I did. You know, now I had this understanding that all of a sudden these other people on these higher spiritual worlds were helping me. And the first thing that happened, I felt the same feeling that I used to feel when I'd had these nightmares, just a complete blackout. And then this time I began to open my consciousness and I heard this, this like angelic voice telling me, okay, these are the, the lower astral forces that are trying to, you know, basically destroy your consciousness and you have to face it. You have to face that fear. So I said, okay, I'm going to fight. I'm going to face this fear. I'm not going to allow myself to be afraid of this. So I wanted to see it, you know. And then I started feeling like I was being lifted up and I was coming out of it. And then all of a sudden they stormed me even more. It was like a billion gigantic mosquitoes all biting me at once and just totally swarming on me. And so I continued fighting it. It seemed like it went on the entire night. And this other voice, this angelic voice kept telling me, keep, keep going. You can, you can overcome this. And so I just said, yep. I May I ask it. you, when you say things like mosquitoes biting you or bugs biting you, what were they actually? They're actually, uh, you know, th that would be a very abstract question for me to answer, but they, they actually are lower astral uh, forces that I had created out of my fear and that through your thoughts, you can create, in other words, you create the Frankenstein monster and he comes back to kill you. So I had created what basically became something that was draining my energy and was causing me to have these horrible nightmares that would affect me in ways that I wasn't really aware of. And so as I began to continue to try to face that energy, all of a sudden I was on my bed and I was laying there, you know, and it was like, I was in the dream, but I was actually on my bed and it was like, everything was awake. And I was in this really, really lucid state. And then right next to me on the bed is this, I call him a muscular demon. It was just this monstrous looking uh, green. It was like, kind of like a Hulk type thing, but I just felt this hatred in his eyes. And his eyes were bright red and he was just beaming at me like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. And I just looked over and I go, I'm not afraid of you anymore. You're going to have to just go on and let yourself be helped just like the, I'm being helped. And all of a sudden I saw him and he began the, the red beam of light kind of just disappeared from his eyes. And then he changed his form and he completely dissipated into myself. It was me. And yeah. I felt myself in both bodies. That's what was so amazing. And so at that point, I've never had those uh, nightmares since that time. In other words, I was I felt like I wasn't even touching the ground for, I don't know, about a month after that. It was just so, so powerful of a healing. But then I had a lot of other stuff that I had to deal with, and I still do. But those particular uh, obsessions or that negative aspect has I've been freed of it I've healed myself of it so that's what I've came come here to do and I need to do a lot more of it you know and most people do have a particular mission it's different for each person that's so, such a powerful story I would imagine when each of these episodes is complete and you have so released this pattern that you've been living under which obviously affects everything in your life that when you come back, you're an entirely different person. Your, op your operating system is completely different. Well, that's the other thing about, you know, the, um, the interesting universal principle, I guess you could say, that we're trying to talk about is that as you have these healing experiences that are coming directly from your psychic body, it's actually the energy body itself that you can't see, just recreating the physical body, that body is stepped up in frequency when you have a healing, when one of these horrible black blotches within it is able to be cleansed and healed. And so what happens is your psychic body is stepped up to a slightly higher frequency. And that also uh, relates into your physical body. So even your physical body 
now has a slightly finer relationship to, you know, the uh, basic intelligence, whatever you want to call it, your spiritual nature. And so you become a little more sensitive. And mm -hmm. then you have another one and you become, and eventually you get to a point to where you've become so refined after a lot of this type of stuff, obviously, thousand, who knows how long it would take, that you don't even really come back into a dimension where the physical uh, relationship of life exists. You're actually going to function in a higher frequency in a place where you can't even, your imagination can't hardly even take you to the level of joy, of purity, of creativity that you're going to be able to function on and live on. It's, it's just, it's like almost like you're a part of the creating of the universes as they exist in an infinite number of dimensions. So you can see it just goes on and on and on. Beautiful. I love it. Um, you are also a student and a teacher, and, and forgive me if I say this wrong, Unarius Academy yeah. of Science. Unarius, and, yeah, go ahead. And also a channel and a spokesperson for the Universal Brotherhood of Light at Unarius. I was just wondering if you could unpack that a little bit. What does that mean? What are those implications? Well, that was where I think I had the most profound experiences with connecting with somebody who was a super, super advanced spiritual teacher. And I, a lot of people, you know, would call it a cult or they would say it's this or that. And uh, it doesn't matter, you know, it's like the, the power that I felt from the teacher and from the teachings and from the books that they have, they have, I should think about 200 books that they've put out. And when you read the books, when I first started reading the books, I'd be reading the pages and it was like I was just scanning this higher frequency energy that was just flowing through me. That went on for quite a while. And then it got to a point to where, okay, you, you can raise your frequency so far and then you have to work stuff out because now the blocks come in. You know, the, the negative stuff that you have to deal with and as you work those through, and Unarius describes it in an incredible way, uh, how this process works, then you actually start to become more aware of your connection with your spiritual self and also with your purpose, your main important purpose, and which is so important that you can't even fathom it until you go to the other side, because it's just, it's mind boggling, the change in seeing the reality of life and what it truly is and then what what the average reality of a human being living in this physical world would believe it is you know i've never even heard of unarius before and that's amazing because i'm in the same world as you and very it, it hasn't become really you know large scale but um i mean everybody needs to find their own connection with whatever teachings are, because I went through a lot of teachings before that. I mean, just reading books. And that's what it was with the Unarius. I just read the books and then, you know, there was other elements involved. But um, I think that's where you you begin to pick up information. Like I read all of the Carlos Castaneda books. I, you know, I think I started with Seth Speaks. Right. And, you know, she'd be smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer, <laughs> channeling this supposed spiritual information. But I mean, to me, it was fascinating. It was, it was very philosophical. It was interesting. So everybody's going to have a different take on all this different stuff. And to me, it was trying to understand that my ego is my own worst enemy, or I'm my own worst enemy. And that's my inability to have an open mind to something that kind of disturbs the status quo of what I believe. And uh, Unarius was able to do incredible. It stands for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Science. That's U-N-A-R-I-U-S. Uh, so yeah, the, the teachers who brought it were uh, the most advanced that I've ever been involved with. They're both gone now, but you know. Okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. And you yourself, I want to talk about your creativity because you brought up creativity a lot. I have looked at your paintings, amazing. And your book too, I just want to mention Solific Journey also has many of your paintings in it. And you do this woodwork and this 
um, talk about your inspiration, talk about your creativity, your art, your painting, everything. What is it for you and how has it helped your consciousness? I think that creativity is got to be the healthiest healing uh, experience that I have been able to somehow connect with in my life because I didn't have it before those, you know, before the age of about 28. And since then, every time I go, and I, I have a lot of different ways that I do it now, you know, there's, I got into computers, I got into Photoshop, I got into painting digitally. I still do acrylic paintings by hand. And so there's so many different ways that you can begin to learn all the different aspects that are involved in both art and the expression of art, but also more importantly, the importance of expressing creativity as a means of connecting with that positive self, that positive higher consciousness that everybody has, but a lot of times they're blocked off from it. So when I connect with a good painting that I'm doing, when I'm really enjoying, they don't all turn out great. You know, sometimes you gotta delete, delete, delete. <laughs> but um, a lot of the times they blow your mind just by the fact that something comes through that you didn't really think you knew how to do. So it's like, wow, where did that come from, you know? And so you really feel like you're something of a channel, like I was talking about the, 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 the transceiver, the receiver receiving the information and then being able to kind of apply it onto the canvas. And then it carries the frequency, it carries that energy so that whoever looks at it, but you know, hopefully is going to be uplifted and feel that same positive information that went into it. And a huge part of it is just, learning not to take your own uh, ego and say, oh, look what I did, you know? I mean, that's harder, incredibly difficult to do, even though you, you were a part of the process, but that's, I think, what I'm learning more and more about is you have to let go of all your attachments to the various things that your ego wants to take credit for because that goes against the universal principles. That's not really true. It's not really there. I mean, you have an individual uh, personality, you're an individual spiritual being, but the attachments that you have created for yourself, and you know, it could be drinking alcohol, it could be taking drugs, whatever, you know, if that's gonna be something that's gonna be negative in the sense of your progression, then, you know, you have to take that into consideration and, and think about making some changes, but, you know, it's going to be always different for everybody. I'm curious about how love has changed for you. I know you're married and I'm just curious, like the before the contact experience and the now of who you are. And I know that's a broad many decades, but what I mean is were there contact experiences that actually changed who you are as a man around love and around relationship? You know, I think it has to do with each personality has their own specific set of traits, you know? And so mine have to do with, I see love as something where you do not have any, um, it's something that you just let go of, you know, in other words, you, you just try to be that love and allow it to radiate out, but you don't try to control something, you know, it, it, it's, I'm not really describing it very well. You know, it's just kind of the way that I've always seen it is that we are living embodiments of this infinite intelligent force, which is pure love. And so I don't have any, I try not to have attachments to it, you know, and even if I have a relationship with someone and these, this is what I felt when I was on the ship between these individuals, the relationships that they had would be more intense than any relationship I could have with another person. Uh, but they have it with everyone on in their civilization. They have it they all have that kind of relationship with each other because they love each other so much 
and they're so interested in just being helpful. And uh, I, I don't know if I'm describing it very well. I'm struggling here a little bit, but it's like a non-attached type of feeling. And that's always been the way I've kind of related to love. It's different, you know, for each person. My wife's completely different. You know, she's very loving, nurturing in every way and very angelic in a lot of ways. So it's different than me. I'm more of the kind of the cold hearted, uh, non-attached love. <laughs> but yeah, I'm learning. I, you know, there's probably a lot I need to learn in that department too. Uh, that's hilarious. And it's amazing because you guys have been married for a long time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, when I first saw her, you know, it was just like, I asked her friend, I go, that, lady, that, that girl, she's, she seems so angelic. You know, she was, I could just see this, this beautiful, beautiful humility and love and energy, kind of like the, the individuals, I, the, the girls that I saw on the ship. And so I was just amazed that I could feel that beautiful, beautiful energy. And, and um, so it's different than, you know, certain types of other physical love to some extent, but, you know, that's a part of it too. And everybody has the different relationship to that part of it. I mean, we all have our physical drives and desires. They don't ever go away. Um, it's just part of uh, being in the animal kingdom in a way, you know, as you evolve in the higher levels of consciousness, what we know as sex becomes something where it's no longer in the form that would be recognizable as sex, but it's a thousand times more intense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so much more of a you know, whatever it is that you're trying to experience in, in having sex. Now multiply that a million times. And that's kind of the relationship. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm just going by again, what I felt and what I saw in those those individuals and what I've learned. And, that, and that's the way I see it. You know, that the, the love is something that everyone on those more positive civilizations have for each other and as they develop into higher and higher spiritual uh, worlds where they no longer have physical bodies it even becomes more intense in other words you're not born out of somebody else's physical body in a physical way like uh, more of an animalistic way that we are here you're actually they bring you in through a mental process and they help you to develop and grow from being a child, but it's there's no physical relationship to it. So they're bringing their energies in, streaming streaming them to you, and you already know where you're going because you're developed enough. I don't know if this is making any sense. And so between you wanting to be a part of this family and this family wanting you to be a part of them, they focus their energy and you focus your energy. And so you're actually born into that world in kind of a materialization, but then you still have to continue on with your progression. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been doing a lot of research recently on the Zeta Reticuli, and I'll call them a people for want of a better word, but the Zeta Reticuli have this sense amongst them that they are one. They operate, even though they're separate people, they still operate as a one consciousness. Uh, very much connected with the divine. And so for them, we earthlings are incredibly fascinating because we operate from individuality. So I just wonder, as you describe this, um, it's different for sure than the Zeta Reticuli because they are also devoid of emotion and they're coming to us and often do the contactee work because they want to learn about emotion so they can start to reincorporate that which they released and found didn't work for them, right? They want to get back the emotion. But it also yeah. sounds like this oneness you're describing is very much like what you experienced. What was that the board used to say? Something is futile. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched Star Trek. Yeah. You said No, that, that, you know, I mean... That, in a sense, I think that there are civilizations. I'm not saying that is relative to Zeta Reticular or any other civilization that you're talking about, but there are ones that have kind of gone in a wrong, gone in a direction that's not necessarily in a progressive way. And so they have um, 
extremely advanced technology, but they're actually going in reverse. In other words, they had advanced to a certain spiritual level, but then they began to utilize all that information that they had garnered through pure knowledge of this infinite intelligent force, started using it selfishly, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden found themselves in a much lower frequency, a, small, a much lower world. And then, you know, even the fact that they had developed that energy and that power on that spiritual side, now all that energy is trapped. And so it actually creates an even worse situation for them because now they have to be able to develop themselves and pull out of that you know, all of the negative aspects of selfishness that they had already learned to overcome mm. and the attachments to physical body in our physical world. This has been so cool. <laughs> I'm really glad you came on and I have the opportunity to get to know you and your story. I saw something about you somewhere and I immediately became intrigued by you. And so I reached out and I'm really glad you said yes. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Where can people work with you, see your stuff? Give us some. Oh, we're, um, let's see. I don't know if anybody would, would want to go do something like this, but I'm going to have an art show at Starworks USA, which is this weekend, actually. We're, we're leaving on uh, Thursday, me and my wife. Where is so that? Gonna, that? It's um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. And it's in... Um, Laughlin, Nevada. So it's kind of like in one of the casino hotels and but I'm going to have a big uh, a bunch of my artwork there and there's going to be a lot of speakers speaking about UFO activities and stuff and Paula um, she's the one who's putting it on. What's her last name? Anyway, my wife. Okay. Can't I can't. <laughs> um, and also Doug I just want to re-mention Douglas Taylor visionaryart.com and your book is Soulific Journey. No, it's Soulic Journeys. Soulic. I kind of sold out of the books. I think I have about 10 or 12 left. So I haven't really been kind of been hanging on to them just for the heck of it. But uh, also the Conscious Life Expo, which happens in uh, at the LA Hilton, February 4th through the 7th. I always do a talk there and have my artwork out there too. And so people can meet me there. Or, you know, they can contact me off my website. I'm on Facebook, Doug Art, something or other. <laughs> I don't know. Now it's meta. It's not Facebook. You know, not meta. The metaverse. Well, um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to thank you for the opportunity to get to know you and for sharing your story. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. I've totally appreciated speaking with you. It's really wonderful. They have such wonderful questions. And so we were kind of on the same frequency, I guess. <laughs> we had a frequency relationship. <laughs> yep, it's been great. It's great. Appreciate and I it. hope to see you sometime at Conscious Life Expo for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really fun. We always, we always have a good time there. Well, folks, I end this show with this quote from Demi Lovato. I believe in aliens. I think it would be way too selfish of us as mankind to believe we are the only life forms in the universe. We've had to reschedule Captain Randy Kramer because he had a situation in his life, but as we all do at times, um, but we are welcoming him back hopefully next week. And we are also bringing in a woman by the name of Morgan who deals with the fairy and fae. And I have not gone there before, but as we say in the ET UFO world, boy, once you start going down that path, you get into all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So I cannot wait to have those conversations. Be sure to subscribe, like, leave a comment. And if you're enjoying this podcast and you would like to see what we look like, we invite you to go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Thank you so much for joining us on this number one weekly transformation conversation. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality. Thanks for joining us.